So before we get started with the official unboxing, I um, just wanted to share with you guys the, the state in which this box arrived in. Now, I unfortunately, this is like the third package from UPS that was uh, delivered in poor condition uh, this year. A lot of times, I wouldn't even show off a game uh, that arrives this poorly, but uh, Chip Theory Games uh, makes a sturdy product. So even though things don't look like they were packaged in quite a sturdy enough box, and it looks like UPS literally punted my package across the country, um, I'm hoping that everything in here is um, still intact. But I just wanted to just kind of show off um, you know, this is just completely split down the sides. There's this, you know, please handle with care, fragile sticker that's, you know, crunched. And you can tell that, that something too heavy was placed on this box. It's one thing that it was split, but if you look at it from the side here, it's, it, you know, it's obvious that something heavy was placed on top of this box with a giant fragile sticker on it. And my neoprene mat box, is bashed in but worst of all it's completely missing like the flap the, the, this was just sitting wide open on my front porch like this i don't know how this didn't just like fall out somewhere and the ups guy just be like oh well you know there it goes um so yeah not too happy with ups uh chip through your games if you're watching this try fedex next time um anyways let's uh get all this uh, crap box out of the way and take a look at the fun stuff. All right, so here is the neoprene mat. Um, it appears to be okay, it's a little dusty I feel like compared to most of the mats and that's probably just from the package being wide open but I bought the big one which it is bigger than I expected it is not even fitting on my table I'm gonna need to get a bigger table that's just that's just that um, but this side of it I went with the big one because this side is there's no graphics on it or anything like that there's no um, play area markings it's just scenery um, I think this is a nice setup that can be used for uh, multiple things. There's you know, various, I don't even know what like these things are supposed to be, but they're just kind of there and they're not distracting. As I attempt to flip this over now, you'll see it's the same picture, but the other side of this oh my Lord, is set up in such a way that there is a place for everything and everything in its place uh, when it comes to playing too many bones. So this would be, I know it's probably hard to see, but there are very faint outlines. Again, they're not trying to take away from the beautiful neoprene mat, but this would be, um, I'm trying to pick up on the symbols here, but I'm pretty sure this is like the battlefield mat. These are definitely your minion stacks right here, along with some initiative die. And then there's, you, know, you could play four player too many bones at this neoprene mat and everybody would have their own spot with uh, trove loot here and their gear lock mats. Um, uh, trying to, mm, not 100% sure what this is. Anyways, really nice mat, nice and thick, stitched edging. The only problem is it's absolutely ginormous. So, um, yeah, let's take a look at the other stuff now. All right, so here we have the base box of Unbreakable. This is, again, can be combined with uh, all other components of Too Many Bones, or it is a standalone expansion, so you could just pick up Unbreakable and, you know, go for it. This is, you know, a really nice way of doing it. I actually came into Too Many Bones via the Undertow box and really loved, you know, just 
playing with those two characters, picked up the, you know, one expansion par character for it, but played that one a lot before I decided to expand on my Too Many Bones universe. So, uh, small box, but it is a tight box. So, here we have the inside of the box, very nicely decorated. And we have the rule book here. So, um, I, I think they've got most of the kinks out now, but you can see this is rule book 1.0. They may have some errata down the road, but one nice thing they have included in here is the returning to Obendar section right here. So if you are familiar with Too Many Bones, basically just highlight these um, several areas here, most of them covering the new types of baddies and the rock and lava, and then there's loot, light or light loot being added and the the loot and lava which we'll talk about here in a second but other than that it's a you know from what you should come to expect from a too many bones rule book it looks very similar and you know a lot of this uh, if you're familiar with too many bones should be pretty straightforward so i believe even in the back yeah so they have this basically kind of follow along where you can read through and a uh, really nice, well done, just kind of visual example there. So there is the rule book for Unbreakable. Now we have a box set up very similar to the way Undertow was set up. And I now this is the way the core box is set up. The core box is smaller as well. So we have our tuck boxes love these tuck boxes um we'll take a look at these cards here in just a minute let's just kind of get get through everything here pull everything out so we have got some dice for our uh, gear locks looks like both of those are tucked into there we have lots more <laughs> attack and defense dice we have all of our uh, static dice here and a few more things just to check out that are a little different here. This is now your, um, if you are utilizing the uh, adventure mat, the little ne neoprene mat, this replaces that crystal clear flattened cube. Um, here is their D6 that they always give you, but nice uh, marble lava look to it. A few of these tokens, which are basically scar tokens from the, uh, oh, what is it, Age of Tyranny uh, expansion. That uh, All the rest of this stuff, stuff should look very pretty familiar. These are for the um, boss battles. Um, so there we go. We have some lane marker chips and a whole bunch of health chips shouldn't need those hopefully and then we have uh, all of our baddies another a very thick day counter look at that we're gonna have to take a look at that and somewhere in here are there we go the lava chips so let's just kind of keep digging into the box here to see what we got so we have figment there's two starting gear locks So again, this is something they did with uh, Undertow to kind of reduce the cost of the initial box. So we have just two gear locks in the box, but we have three others that we're going to show off here today. We have Figment. His whole thing is like warping around, uh, chrono and trigger. I love that fact that that's one of the things. Here is the battle, the Swiss cheese battle mat. So um, we're going to show off how that works here in just a second. And then we have Gale here who is more uh, robot than human. You can see she's, you know, got like a robot arm, robot legs. Um, and so you're essentially upgrading her robot parts. And then we have the, all of the nice big sheets. So here's Gale's icon, Figment's icon, 
the Garg Gear Lock Reference Guide, and then the completely comprehensive Batty Skills Reference Sheet. So this is double-sided, but this should have every single keyword that uh, has ever been and will ever be in Too Many Bones. And then we have a second piece of unique artwork in the bottom of the box. So let's first take a look at probably the biggest uh, gimmick as far as Unbreakable is concerned, and that's the new battle mat. So uh, initiative meter has been pushed over here to the side. Um, I guess that's probably, I, I don't know why, because I think an undertow was up top, or maybe it was on the side, who knows. Um, but if we break into our chips here, every single battle you're going to enter, you're gonna be putting these chips down to fill in those holes. All right, so you see that there are rock sides and lava sides. I wonder if they gave us extras here. Let's find out. No, nope, exactly enough. So in a traditional battle, this is might it what, um, you know, how it would start. So you can move freely over top of these no problem, but at certain points in the game, they're gonna tell you to be flipping some of these over, and all of a sudden there's lava seeping up through the floor. Now, if you're a pass through here or standing on these, you're gonna take damage, but so do enemies, so consider that. And one of the new things that has to do with loot is the fact that you can always spend a loot uh, to uh, think of it as the loot you're always spending is like a canteen of water. You're dumping it on the lava and it turns back to rock, but you waste the loot. You don't get to spend it on whatever you had it for. So something to consider. So throughout the scenario, sometimes maybe like a back corner or something will start with uh, lava already in it. You can see all of the chips are kind of unique as far as the artwork is concerned, but um, yeah, there you go. And since these chips are just kind of randomly placed out, um, they put the lane markers up here. And then here you can see here's the baddie section and the gear lock section, um, melee ranged, melee ranged, so on and so forth. So this is the biggest uh, difference in how the game works. Now, one thing I am curious about or have been curious about is so normally you have a, a stack of chips like this and they usually they slide around real nicely on the neoprene. I'm wondering, yeah, so no problems there. Everything still slides around nicely. I can still, you know, slide around the whole stack because this is how you're moving your, your gear locks around. If anything, it's almost smoother. Um, these things don't, don't really budge. And so no problems, there we go. So here is Gale. Gale, again, is one of the uh, included gear locks in the Unbreakable Core set. So uh, I mentioned this briefly earlier, but Gale's whole thing is that she's like part um, robot. So she's not quite gasket, um, but she has, uh, I don't know, some, some similar stuff here. So just some interesting points about her um, mat, you'll notice, is that there's these uh, three slots here. So these are her, um, uh, what are they called again? Uh, major skill dice. So gust rockets, macro, neural implant, and arm cannon. You're actually going to take those scar tokens that we pointed out earlier, right here. Uh, these are going to be placed in here at the beginning of the game, campaign, whatever it may be. And you actually have to activate her backup plan, uh, mechanical protocol here, which is kind of in the middle. And that allows you to remove one of the scar tokens, enabling you to then train on this major skill dice. What that then does is gives you a die you can roll 
four decks on your turn, but it sits up here in your active slot and it boosts everything else within that, um, you know, profession or whatever. So Gust Rockets, this is her movement protocol here. Um, Gust Rockets, once rolled and sits active, will boost everything up here. So, you know, definitely those decisions you have to make, are you gonna roll, you know, all of your major skill dice at the beginning at the cost of not being able to do anything else but then have everything boosted for you know all these fun decisions that you're usually um, ready to make also her consumable down here is quite interesting the the things that can hit on it are heal any party member for you know x or no that's that's targeted med boost um, brain train Reroll one die in your active slots, either apply the new results or return the die to its previous result. So you can reroll a uh, major skill die. Or brain scan, reroll as many dice in your active slots as you wish, one at a time. For each rolled die, either apply the new result or return it to its previous result. So her consumable allows her to then adjust those major skill dice. Otherwise, her main skill trees here are kind of a movement skill tree, a defense skill tree, and an attack skill tree, and then a support skill tree. So she's a very well-rounded uh, character. You can see she's great uh, in co-op and a little tricky in solo, probably because she takes some time to ramp up and needs to be protected. So if she was there by herself, uh, might not work so well. Up next, we have Figment. Um, so Figment's his gimmick here is that he kind of is a time traveling gear lock. I believe his backstory is that he's actually um, from a time way in the past and has time traveled up into the future. Or maybe it's the other way around. I can't remember. But um, he does a lot of interesting stuff with the initiative track. He can actually move people up and down the initiative track, dealing damage to them for how far they move. Um, and or he can like put himself lower in the initiative track and then basically skipping everybody that he surpassed so he can completely you know bypass someone's turn all of these obviously are based on rolling a skill die so you can't do it every time but um and then he's got this whole um, staff wielder um so these here allow him to roll out the die and these the numbers on the die mean that on that round um, you would exhaust the die and a you get to do like a bigger bonus one other than that when they sit, are sitting up here in your locked slot they're doing something every single round so ideally you would want to roll like the five so that and roll them early so then they're doing like pinging damage on certain baddies every single round and then on round five boom you exhaust that die finally and, and hit him for the big one. So some very interesting stuff. He's got three consumables here um, that are, you know, this doing true damage to a baddie before you in the initiative meter, exhaust up to two staff wielder or theatician profession dice in your lock slot and resolve them as if it's the current round matches. So if you have this cobalt die and you hit on it and then use it, you don't even have to roll, say your chrono triggers, you can just say, oh, here it's round four i'm acting like i'm rolling them and then flash rewind as you can revive a ko'd gear lock so again just some really cool stuff it's amazing that every single time they come out with a new gear lock they come out with a, a new way for them to be asymmetrical from the rest so this is uh figment again all right up next i just wanted to highlight a few of the baddies uh, that you'll be getting in the uh, Unbreakable core set here. So the biggest thing is this new break type baddie, which has this, um, you know, white skull-like symbol on it. Um, so a lot of these guys deal in the, uh, with flipping over the, the tiles into lava. So they're the ones who are going to be turning things into lava or flame soak allows them to like recover HP from the lava. These guys also, when they're on lava, do not take damage like everything else in the game. And there's also some just really fun, like this uh, mushroom, angry, super angry mushroom I thought was a cool one. Or the, this like nerd, nerd troll. I don't know what's going on there. Um, here, uh, this guy's pretty spooky. I thought that was a cool one. 
and then this one here that's doomed experiment it's like a, a beaker with legs so I was just wanting to highlight some of these um, also the uh, improved day counter dial here is just a double thick chip so that if you've got it sitting down especially in your adventure mat it's easier to grab and spin it used to be that you had to kind of you know just twist it with your finger like this but now it sits higher than the neoprene so really nice addition to the game there um, some new things that uh, I don't recall seeing before, like decoy here. When defeated, place a decoy effect die on a position with HP. So essentially you have to go for the decoy first. It doesn't do anything other than distract your attention. Um, let's see, eruption here. This is the one where you basically flip a thing over into lava. Um, there's pollute now on top of poison, pollute like it's everybody that's not on a lava position. Stench here. When defeated, place a stench effect die on this position. Treat as untargetable obstacle. When stench is placed, all units adjacent to this die are immediately dealt true damage. Additionally, gear locks moving adjacent to stench are dealt one true damage. So just some, some crazy stuff here. Or terrify. Um, basically, you afflict terrify on someone. They cannot uh, hit you back if you have terrify. So... Um, that's just some of the, the new stuff. Again, this list here should be comprehensive of everything there is uh, to know. All right, last but not least, in the core box, we have the cards. Now, most of these are encounter cards that I'm not going to show off. That would, you know, spoil things. There is a you know brand new encounter cover card there. Um, but, and then there's some loot. So... I don't know whether you would consider this a spoiler or not. I'm just going to briefly show off some of these because some of these are really, um, you know, just, just burnt trove map makes sense. But um, secret deodorant, shiny, you know, pop locks, um, well healed boots, battle yo yo. Um, what else? There was a couple of pro cyan powder, um, sit melange, thick bandage. Uh, troll skin coat, comfy hiking boots, uh, performance enhancing slugs, safe cracker, big old magnet. So just some really fun uh, stuff in here. Gale force winds, that's like a gale thing. Uh, recyclables, vicious cycle, fortunate, 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 fortunate. Um, also, trove loot. Again, some of you may consider this spoilerish, but um, I'm not quite sure what this card is for. Um, it's almost like a cover card, but um, it was sitting there. But um, Batty Whistle hastily assembled. There's a go. Nobulus's personal programmable defibrillator, um, serial driller, pacemaker, chewable vitamins, portable cow. That was that was one of the funniest ones. Um, so there you go. Um, just more stuff to add. And again, all of this is playable. Uh, right out of the box. You don't need to own the original game. So let's now uh, take a look at some of the uh, additional characters. All right, the first gear lock that we have that's a, you know, one of the just add-on gear locks is Carcass, known as the survivalist. So Carcass it was at one point a culinary chef who now refuses to eat anything that he hasn't killed first so as gruesome as it is he can take baddies uh, that he has killed or pull them out of a discarded baddie stack and cook them into recipes that he can then use to gain bonuses so here's his you know his color scheme and his uh, chip dye and things like that but one of the things you're going to start with is his meat hooks and so your meat hooks starts at one now i believe it's during the um maybe it's one of the dies here or maybe it's a consumable but there's a way to increase this die and this just sits here it doesn't have to do anything but this represents how many baddies you can keep stored uh, on your play mat to then use in recipes. So in the actual uh, backup plan, you can unlock these recipes here. So there's gross food. This one 
actually does not require a baddie. Um, and this is just like a single use thing that you can then tuck aside. The rest of these recipes here are face down at the beginning of any you know campaign or game. And as you earn them, you'll you know just earn the top one and it sits as your learned recipes. Then you will need to roll something like fast food here to be able to place a baddie chip on this and then this becomes a single use item. It becomes a loot card. Um, so you basically can create your own loot within the scenario. For example here this says remove all dice from any gear locks active slots and deal number of true damage to any baddie where the number is equal to the cooked baddie's attack stat. So obviously you would want to place a baddie chip on here that has a high attack. Whereas this one uh, if you put a no, I forget what they're called but the fungi type uh, you get plus one to your defense stat. Uh, pan seared here heal yourself um, to based on the cook baddies HP stat so it does matter what type of or what baddie you place on these but you can see all of the rest of these other than gross food has a place that you're gonna place a baddie so that's kinda his thing he kills a baddie anything he kills he gets to place on his mat or there's certain dice that allow him to go into the discard pile so you're actually gonna have to keep track of a kinda discarded baddie stack when you're playing with carcass he can dig into the discard pile place a baddie on his meat hook and again uh, you know by the end of say a campaign you may have six meat hooks which means you can hold six baddies up here ready to put into any one of your recipes and then be able to use it so that is his whole thing here he also has um, what number die is this this is the 10 die so the simulate die here is pretty interesting this one actually is not rolled. It basically just has the all the die faces of all the different types of baddies out there. I'm trying to see, I don't see a break type baddie, which is interesting. Um, anyways, if you have a baddie on your meat hooks, you can simply discard the baddie off of your meat hook and then choose, to, you, you set this die to whatever, uh, the type of baddie it is and then you can use this or you can give it to someone else you can give it to another gear lock and then depending on what type of baddie it is here on the back of his mat say this type of baddie has compounds so you're adding essentially a keyword to that person it only lasts one round but this is a, a die that if you have uh, doesn't need to be rolled for decks the last thing uh, that you're gonna get with carcass which is probably one of the reasons why he's becoming one of the fan favorites is you actually get a real life recipe book in his box so this is cooking with carcass and this is actual recipes here like lettuce wrapped bog meat the picture looks a little gross here but this isn't a real recipe that you can make in your own home uh, it's a very nice well done you know dinners uh, snacks and sides um, so soups and stews, snacks and sides, dinners and desserts. So there's roughly 20, maybe 15 or so recipes in this book. Legitimate chip theory, too many bones cookbook comes with. Now I know we just looked at carcass and that's becoming a fan favorite, but I don't think people have really taken a look at static yet. Static has so much to offer and it's ridiculous in my opinion that his you know, difficulty is so low because he has so much to consider on his turn in the way of all these different skills to use but his biggest thing is that he starts with three um, dice already placed so he's gonna start with his inner piece die which is die number one here if I can get them out Oh my goodness. His inner peace die is going to start on the board. His transcendency is going to start on the board at also at zero. So these are counter dice. And last but not least, his uh, knuckle zappers here are also going to start at zero. So these are always on the map. They don't reset between days. Um, and uh, these are gonna allow you to do a lot of stuff. The interesting thing is inner peace ticks up every time you don't attack or spend an attack die. Um, so there are a couple other ways to, to you know, 
do damage without rolling attack dice, but if you can roll only defense dice, basically if you're just sitting there meditating, you uh, will increase this even more. Then once this ticks up, and it can get up to a you know, maximum of five there, you can spend it in various ways. You can spend it to increase this die, which we'll talk about here in a second, and you can spend it to um, give yourself dex for a turn. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. No, I think you can spend it to increase your attack. Anyways, you basically meditate. You can then spend this counter to uh, do certain things. Transcendency here, if you are spending your inner piece to tick this up, you can tick this off, tick it back down to refresh or get back an exhausted die. So normally you roll one of your skill dice and then they're just gone for the rest of the battle. Well, Static here can bring his back and he can bring it back multiple times as long as he has the transcendency to spend. Then uh, this one doesn't start on his map, on his map, but Perseverance here also is a counter die. It can be trained and then once it's there it just stays on his mat and counts up and down perseverance ticks up every time he takes damage from a baddie attack and so as he gets hit as he takes damage this increases and then he can spend this to increase his attack in return last but not least here are his knuckle zappers his knuckle zappers are you know brass knuckles but these are where these two electrified chips come in um, basically he can spend these to put these into a baddies health stack so this is not a die per se um, you know effect die that you would place on top this actually goes into their health stack so the more if this is all the way up to five and you spent all five of them on one, you would take this chip and put it five up from the bottom, which means that baddie is electrified until they have lost five health, and then once this sits on the bottom, it is removed. But while a baddie is electrified, a lot of these skills work off of that and do additional damage to uh, electrified baddies, but it also what it says down here that their attack stat is reduced by one, and anytime you deal attack damage to them, it deals one damage to so it arcs over to adjacent baddies. You can increase this by using your um, energize skill here, which just simply increases on your backup plan. You can increase your knuckles by one just by spending two bones. Last thing I want to talk about here, and just you know, th there's so many cool things here, so many cool skill dice. Uh, this whole section here that is, is it the Albert? No. Brawler, Overcharge, no. Talon Strike, where is it? There's a whole set of these, one of these that based on how far you move, so if you build up your dexterity and run all around all the board and then activate one of these dice that are sitting in say your you know active slot or something like that, then you can do uh, a lot more power. But anyways, his uh, innate and then innate plus one allows him to roll defense dice in the recovery phase and go ahead and pre-lock them into his backup plan. Innate plus one allows him to roll five innate regular allows him to roll three so he starts he's going to be starting the battle with backup plan dice already in place so i am really looking forward to playing static i think he's got a lot of cool things to offer and last but not least for this set we have polaris who is probably the more advanced gear lock in this set so polaris's whole gimmick are her orbs now we use the orbs uh, they are represented by these little metal discs and this little graph right here represents a you know battle mat so these are the positions of the battle mat so assuming we're sitting here and the battle mat is above us this would be like where the baddies start and this would be like where we start so as you're moving these around, you're just imagining that they're really just hovering over those positions on the battle mat. And so you've got these four orbs, and then you can bring out this fifth one. 
that's you bring it out based on the extra orb consumable but you can manipulate these around and then say for example um, whoops tucked that guy right there let's just say for example that you've put them all say three orbs over there and then you're standing say here maybe um, what you can do is say a minor recall or a major recall or some of these other positions you can recall your orbs and everything they fly through as they come back to your position and then they're you know, kind of exhausted off the map they deal damage to now there's a lot of these skill dice that say jagged orb can do bleed effect as it passes by armor piercing orb can do true damage um, empath can transfer a status effect so it's not just about putting these out and then recalling them back again um, uh, certain positions like uh, there's one here that you can heal your fellow gear locks who are below an orb position so standing in the same position as an orb or you can poison baddies or anybody uh, so there is friendly fire when it comes to Polaris which also makes her trickier so when you recall these any of your fellow gear locks that also may be in the way you kind of want to make sure they're tucked behind you so that they don't take damage as well uh, when you recall your orbs, um, they have to go in the shortest path. So you couldn't, say for example, if you were standing here, send this one like all the way around the board and back again. But if there are multiple ways that get you to the shortest path, then you as Polaris can choose which path they take. So that usually can help uh get you there so that's her big thing um is keeping up with where these orbs are positioning moving them around moving baddies around um, some of your skill dice allow you to say move or pull baddies into or away from orbs so you can manipulate their position you can like you know pop in and out and and pop down where an orb is all sorts of fun stuff last but not least she has this whole set of dice here her delve dice so these are actually right here and she has to learn these but once she has learned them um, so starting with delve and then deep delve and then dark delve she can roll these during the recovery phase and this is like her spelunking around looking for stuff and she can re-roll them a number of times. So she, if she has just the dealt dice, she rolls it once and she's basically stuck with it unless she spends a Seeking Stone consumable. If she has delve and deep delve, she can roll them once and then re-roll all of them again. Um, and then last but not least, dark delve, she can roll them once, twice, and three times. Uh, I believe I'm reading it correctly that if you choose to reroll you have to reroll all of them so you can't just pick and choose the best ones there are two negative sides on the deep delve and dark delve one one puts uh, true 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 damage on you and the other one brings an extra baddie into the next baddie cube but for the most part these are all doing positive things so similar to um, oh gosh um, I can't remember who I'm, I'm trying to think of but anyways um, almost like a fun little game but just brings you bonuses so you could start with bones in your backup plan similar to static you can start with some buff HP start with some defense get additional loot or you, there's even in the dark delve here one of the die faces is a um, training point to immediately spend so that's really cool. I also think that she has uh, easily one of the coolest colors as far as, uh, you know, background colors are concerned or, you know, themed colors. So that is Polaris. So that does it for our core box and all of our gear locks, both uh, the ones in the core box and uh, kind of standalone expansion gear locks. Last but not least, we have our three kind of small boxes of uh, 40 waves, 40 caves, and Rage of Tyranny that are all going to add uh, basically a lot more baddie chips and encounters. So let's take a quick look at those. Alright, so here are our three smaller boxes again. 
they did this because they are not including the reference sheets anymore with these because they have all inclusive reference sheets in whatever core box that you need to have at least one uh, in order to make use of these expansions. So in the original Too Many Bones uh, Kickstarter campaign, they included 40 days in day lore, which was additional baddies and encounters. They also included Age of Tyranny, which was the campaign uh, setup for Too Many Bones, where you could play through multiple bosses, um, tyrants. So what they've kind of done is uh, come full circle, at least with the 40 uh, theme. I do want to point out, though, that to me it never made sense that 40 days in Daylor was not the campaign because you're like playing, that's the only way you could essentially get up to 40 days. Um, and the Age of Tyranny was not the additional baddies. I feel like those should have been flipped. I always felt like 40 days in Daylor should have been the campaign and Age of Tyranny should have been the additional baddies. But anyways, so they brought in some additional baddies and encounters for Undertow. They gave us some for uh, Unbreakable. And then what they did here is give us uh, like alternate tyrants. So everything in here are tyrants that you will find in Too Many Bones or Undertow, but this is like them them beefed up, uh, different ways to play them. So you could go back and experience some of the older tyrants, um, you know, like Duster or Nobulus in a different way. So let's stick with the uh, kind of unbreakable theme here and take a look at what we've got here. So. Um, again, these are what's going to be very common for even the little mini boxes has, uh, has this stuff in it. So, <clears throat> oh, and they did, they wrapped them all up for us. Of course they did. So these are all mostly probably going to be break type baddies. Really nice little chip holder though here. Um. I wish that they had these with every single type of baddie on them and this is what I could use to store in my trove chest. Anyways, um, so we've got this guy with the big giant hand, uh, that guy's orc deserter, troll basher, stench, okay so he's got stench, weaken and secrete, okay so some of these guys aren't even um, they're, they're not even all break type baddies. Here's one of the big ones. Reach, days, and confuse. Ooh, what's that guy? A abysmal, abyssal bat. And so there you go. And then uh, what basically what's in here, another tuck box, I love these tuck boxes, um, is a whole nother, um, here's how to integrate 40 caves, mix the new baddies in with the existing baddies, create active stacks as normal, um, blah, 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 and add these into the mix. So I'm not gonna show off the encounters because uh, that would be kind of a spoiler. So there we go. And these other ones should look very similar to that. So I'm gonna stick these back in there and just tuck that one out of the way for right now. So let's look at 40 waves in Daylore. Now this one is essentially the exact same thing we just saw, but just more baddies um, for the undertow. So I'm guessing a lot of these, I'm not even gonna get that sucker out. A lot of these are gonna be the Krellin and um, the mech type ones. Uh, what are those called? But those were always fun and interesting and you gotta kinda of play uh, the, the wave or undertow encounters in order to get them. Um, but I always thought they were fun having them. So these guys are always gonna be uh, three point baddie types as opposed to the 1.5s or 20s. So these guys are the ones that are gonna be in the water, like a snapping turtle here and catfish. <laughs> Actually, it's called a pantherfish. 
uh, okay, so this guy, yeah. So you have the gray backs and the uh, teal backs. So this is gonna be a robot type G800, uh, treasure disruption, okay. Here's another oh, uh, star, scarfish, ha <laughs> Oh man, rust bucket, he doesn't look too bad. Break and submerge rock bass. Here we have the Me Mex Mexic Terminator, basically mosquito and Terminator. I could not say it. There's a giant crab. Here's a giant slug. This guy is a krelp instead of kelp. <laughs> oh, Joan the drone. All right. Uh, bribable. Smart, S-M-A-R-T. Okay, smart device. Uh, B, B Dynam. A uh, shock eel, and then everybody's favorite, not Wally, but Batty. <laughs> That's cool. I like Batty. All right. So there's that one. And then last but not least, we have our Rage of Tyranny. Again, these are all, uh, you know, bad guys who you should expect. So uh, it's interesting they put the Undertow uh, box, I think. Or is that both Undertow and Toomey Bones? So let's see. This, we've got some additional dice. So each of the baddies in the here gets a dice, and I'm assuming these have some different faces on them from what we already own. Uh, so this has Rage of Tyranny contains four new day one through three encounters for Too Many Bones and four new day one to two encounters for Undertow, 20 new special encounters, and uh, consists of expansion material for both Too Many Bones and Undertow. So I guess technically if you only have, um, you know, one of them, you know, this expansion, you're only getting 50% out of it. So take that for what it is, whether you want to pick this up or not. Uh, like I said, personally, I really like to start at Undertow. Um, it's a good size box, price point, all that jazz. And um, obviously I haven't had a chance to play Unbreakable yet. I could get ever get into these chips. But uh, I think just the whole manipulating the battlefield and having lava and stuff might be a little trickier. Maybe it won't be. Um, but Duster is one of my all-time favorite gear locks. And Gasket, who was technically an expansion gear lock. Um, so here we have some double-sided... Oh, that's the Goblin Queen's Assassin. Okay, and Goblin Queen Bodyguard Sentry. So these guys all go with... The Goblin Queen here. So here's our friend Nobulus. <clears throat> oh no, that's the Abomination. Okay, Abomination 2.0. And the, the Dragon Broodling. Uh, the Goblin King. Oh no, the Goblin Queen. That looks like the Goblin. Oh yeah, because she was. She came out during that goblin lieutenant bog lieutenant cobalt lieutenant yeah so these guys are all man i'm not remembering all of this here is duster um okay so this is a different nightshade okay okay and this one hmm all right so this doesn't appear to be all of them I know there's some missing here um, but you know again if you have already played uh, everything there is to play which even I have not um, this would be the expansion for you but this is probably the expansion that if you are just starting out and wondering which expansions to get uh, I would wait on um, because this one's giving you variety to uh, what you already have. 
So again, my suggestion is you just start with Unbreakable or Undertow, and then you know if you want some more variety, go get you 40 Waves or 40 Caves, um, and go from there. Uh, pick whichever add-on content you feel like uh, speaks to you, whatever add-on gear lock speaks to you, add them to your mix, play through it, and then once you love it, which I'm sure you will, um, then you can pick up more. So last but not least here, we have our Too Many Bones crossover pack. This is just a fun little promo uh, that they were doing during the Kickstarter. I'm pretty sure you can probably pick this up for like you know, 5 to $10 on their web store or at conventions. So these are loot, but they're loot that are designed around their other games. So let's just take a look at these real quick here. So your convoluted hummingbird. Um, this is from uh, Cloudspire and they actually have dropped in the instruction text this is one of the most you know frequently asked questioned units um, from Cloudspire the, the elephant Kazi here I just think it's fun that they they threw in all that text because it's it's not really a running joke that th this one simple little unit is so complicated but um, it, it's definitely highly talked about so here you've got that loot, and this, this loot's just going to be mixed in with the rest. Command module here is from um, uh, Burn Cycle, jeez, and the Dusk Breaker is from Hoplomachus. So these are their other big major uh, IPs. Uh, interesting that they didn't add a fourth one in here for... Um, I felt like they could have just surprised everybody because they hadn't announced it yet but now that this is delivering Elder Scrolls is their next biggest IP so I feel like we need a fourth one right here anyways that is going to do it for our lengthy detailed unboxing of um, Too Many Bones Unbreakable all the new content if you have any questions please feel free to let me know in the comment section below uh, if you made it this far I appreciate you watching this entire video I know it was long um, consider giving this video a, a like, a thumbs up, and subscribing to the channel. Once again, thanks for watching. Have a great day.